Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you James Kenworth, our colleague and acclaimed playwright. <laughs> and today he's going to talk to us about his play, A Splotch of Red, Kia Hardy in West Ham. We know who Kia Hardy is. Well, James, <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Past. Thank you, my esteemed colleague, <laughs> Anna, thank you very much. Yeah, so I'll talk about my play, A Splotch of Red, Kia Hardy West Ham. But let's start with that. Let's start with it. It's a very good question. Who was Keir Hardy? Not necessarily should know, I think, the young generation. Unless, of course, you know, if you're a mad fan of, you know, rabidly fan of Cor Corbyn. Founder of the Labour Party, Keir Hardy. Father of the Labour Party. Um, and uh, I'll explain that title uh, in, a, in a second, but that's what I'm going to talk about as a playwright. Um, I have written uh, a number of plays. Um, I guess you say with the, the with, I'll talk about why Keir Hardy in West Ham is where I live in Newham. Political history in Newham, you know, I think, is unsurpassed. It's just absolutely incredible um, uh, to think that uh, Keir Hardy fought his first election in in Newham against a Conservative. Um, if anyone knows anything about Newham, <laughs> you know there are never, never, I hope in hell, uh, uh, you know, uh, right now, a Conservative would get anywhere near. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the concept of localist participatory in site-specific environments to my playwriting. What's that mean? Yeah, it does sound academia, and it is, but I can easily translate that. Localist, because I live in Newham, and I've got a lot of strong connections with the schools, uh, and community centres, um, and organisations in Newham, and localist, I suppose, in the... Um, chief sense that my plays involve what's known as a mixed economy, a hybrid casting, professional actors with local kids from the area who, you know, I'd love to indulge in class war, <laughs> but we can't at the moment, but I'm, I'm going to say probably, you know, it doesn't, you know, uh, I think low income families possibly could say don't perhaps get some of the advantages that, you know, more, uh, more advantageous families have in terms of acting, so, so, you know, they work alongside professional actors. And again, that explains participatory and site-specific because I'll explain this. I'll come on to this in a second because the this is the third this, of, a, of a trilogy. Splotcher read all the plays I've done in the last certainly since 2012 have involved site-specific, just meaning it's not in a theatre. Which I love the idea. I don't remember who I was saying this to. I'd probably say it to everyone. You know, it's my, one of my million rants or oh, things I'm passionate about is. I, sometimes I don't even see the point of theatres, buildings. I just, I, I, I hate them for a start. I never feel comfortable in them. Um, I don't find them interesting, uh, you know, unless possibly they're immersive, you know, or, the, or it's electrifying, the acting. But most of the time, I'm ready to go to sleep. Now, what I love about Site Specific, it does provide a completely different experience. And um, Keir Hardy in West Ham was no different to, to the other plays. Um, I think I mentioned Revolution Farm, was a obviously you know it's a contemporary adaptation of Animal Farm set on an inner city farm. My first play in this trilogy, When Chaplin Met Gandhi, is a true story, unbelievable. Charlie Chaplin, you know, the, meets Mahatma Gandhi in Newham in Canning Town. Uh, you know, it should be filmed. It should be filmed. Filmmakers out there, sure they are. And that was actually performed in Kingsley Hall, an amazing, amazing community centre, still operational today where Gandhi stayed in 1931. So you can visit Kingsley Hall in Bow, and you can go up on the roof, and you can actually go into Gandhi's cell. It's very ascetic, so obviously you've got up at four or five in the morning to pray. You can still go into his cell, it's extraordinary. And we performed the play there. And Keir Hardy in West Ham was performed in Community Links building, which is a legendary building, um, and we have, in terms of who was spoken there. So it was appropriate we did Keir Hardy there, and I'll go on to that. Um, yeah, so as I say, the, um, um, and I'll also look at the public unconventional performance spaces I've just mentioned there, and some not non-naturalistic creative language in a splotch of red. Just a quick uh, note about that, you know, non-naturalistic, what do we mean? What does that mean? I know, I often ask myself that about most of academia. What do they mean? Um, it's, you know, non-naturalistic creative language is, again, it's a warning here, uh, umpteenth rant coming up <laughs> about theatre language. Uh, I just, it's obviously my subjective opinion 
obviously, but I can't bear to see social realism in theatre. You know, naturalism. Why? Simple. Because <laughs> I believe you, you, TV does it much better. TV and film can do social, you know, the world as it is. You do it much better. Not saying theatre can't do it, <laughs> you know, but I much prefer, and I think I did, I think I did look at this with Revolution Farm, some of the language in my adaptation of All Wells Animal Farm, that um, I, I really like language that is, you know, it's quite lyrical, quite creative, poetic, and also leaves something to the audience's imagination. Um, so it isn't, you know, it isn't, it's, it, there, this is possibly a symbolism to it, that isn't always purely literal. Um, uh, and I certainly use some of that in, in Keir Hardy and West Ham. So uh, quickly going to go through the biographical information. Keir Hardy, first socialist MP, a Labour, we're going back, aren't we? <laughs> first socialist MP. And it's interesting, if you'd asked me, I wrote this play in 2016. If I'd written it during Tony Blair's years, and I was asked the question, how far do you think Labour Party has moved from its original, you know, philosophy of the founder? You know, you could argue in the, in the New Labour had moved enormous amount away. But of course, I wrote it, I wrote it in 2016, when of course Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> it was like, how? And, and surely, I would think, you know, even, even just a sort of passing familiarity with Corbyn will tell you, he, you know, well, he's a socialist. <laughs> Isn't he? He's a socialist, you know, it's incredible. So you could say that Corbyn, you know, like it says here, we'll go on to this bit, with the recent stunning, I say recent, you can tell I've written this, you know, a couple of years ago and updated it, wholly unexpected landslide victory of the veteran left-winger Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party, it seems the party is returning to its socialist roots under his leadership. And so I put, now is the time to explore and examine the Labour Party's greatest hero, Keir Hardy particularly his experience as an MP for West Ham South, because I think that's probably not very well known, is that um, he's fighting the election for West Ham South uh, in Newham. Newham's got a, Newham is a hotbed, or you could argue was a hotbed <laughs> for political activity, uh, uh, even subversive revolutionary activity. But I, as a playwright, and having lived there for 25 years, I've always found its history is absolutely fascinating. Okay, yeah, so what did the play do? Well, you know, the bare facts, the bare facts. By the way, i just explain that. I love the title. Maybe I love it because I know what it means. But I just love the sound of it, a splotch of red. I could never find out, despite being an academic, you know, in, in my research, I could never find out who said it. It's about West Ham, but I think it was, it sounds derogatory, I think it was possibly made by um, a conservative or a right-winger, you know, at the time, can't, uh, you know, Hardy was around, describing that part of East London as a splotch of red. <laughs> In other words, it's always going to be, <laughs> you know, which is, oh, you're going to be, you know, left wing. Um, but I did, uh, uh, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd definitely I'd nick that as the title. So it's dramatised, what did the play do? Dramatised the Labour Party's founder, greatest pioneer, a uh, historic battle to win the seat of West Ham in Newham and become the first ever. It's, it's extraordinary to think of that. It's not that. It's not hundreds of years ago, <laughs> the first ever Labour. I just, it's extraordinary, isn't it? You know, what do they say about history? You know, if we, we don't need to learn from history, we repeat the same mistakes. And to think that, that the working man didn't have a representative. Or the poor, the, you know, the, you know, the underprivileged, you know, the exploited didn't have a representative until, you know, until Keir Hardy came on. So it's quite remarkable. He is remarkable as well, Keir Hardy. That's another attraction to a playwright, obviously, if someone who's iconoclastic um, and very significant politically and historically also, their background. So, an illeg illegitimate and wretchedly poor son of a servant, Hardy had worked in the coal mines from the age of 10, but he took on the formidable might of the Conservative Party candidate, the wealthy and blue-blooded Major Baines. <laughs> you know, I quite like that, Major Baines. Um, as this wealthy, wealthy, sort of philanthropic um, MP in West Ham. Um, to come and Keir Hardy to beat him, become Britain's first socialist MP. Um, I say I won't go through all of this. The, there's quite a lot of it to get through. Swashwin, as I mentioned earlier, where was it performed? Uh, in Neighbours Hall. So not in a theatre. Neighbours Hall. What is Neighbours Hall? Uh, in Community Links building in Canning Town. So it's the latter where the hall where Keir I actually spoke of. So I love doing that. I've 
as I say, when Chaplin met Gandhi, had those resonances. So Chaplin Gandhi, we performed the play where Gandhi stayed. We perform a squatter led where Keir Hardy actually spoke. And it's just, I find that quite thrilling uh, in terms of the resonances. But not only him, um, Will Thorne, Bertrand Russell, Sylvia Pankhurst, these are all luminaries of, of the left. They, they really are, very huge names there. Um, and as with Kingsley Hall, as I've just said, and Newham City Farm, you know, this, this symbiotic and independent relationship between site history and subject matter, I think, I would argue, gave Swatcher Red an authenticity, a credibility and a realness that perhaps you could lose in a theatre building. Not so you can't have it. That would be crazy to say that. Uh, I think possibly, you know, in a theatre building, I don't like the way also possibly in a theatre building it becomes a museum piece. Oh, yeah, isn't that funny? That's quite amusing, Keir Hardy, you know, who's this really wretchedly poor son. Oh, that's quite, yeah, that was that's hundreds of years ago. It's irrelevant now. I don't know, maybe that's a bit unfair on theatre buildings, but um, the fact that Neighbours Hall is currently in use, has been in use for the last 30 years, as a centre for social change and for the community in Newham seems to give it that. <laughs> you know, look, it is really relevant. It's really, really topical. Um, as I say, the look and feel of Community Links building adds to the sense of realness. It's a former town hall. Uh, staff are dedicated to helping some of the most marginalised and disadvantaged in society. Um, and its political and historical roots are impeccable for a play about Britain's first socialist MP. It was, the, the hall was built by the people, for the people. Fantastic. You know, that's its kind of motto. Uh, so, moving on quickly. By combining a verbal theatricality. <laughs> okay, what does that mean? What does that mean? We're combining a verbal theatrical and unusual and unexpected performance spaces. Before I go on, a verbal theatricality, I just think you can take liberties with language in theatre. That perhaps possibly, arguably, is a little harder to do in, broadly speaking, naturalistic um, uh, technology like films and TV. It's interesting, is it? Because then I, I would ask if anyone disagrees with that, which of course you can. Mm -hmm challenge me afterwards possibly why is Shakespeare so popular still I, I find that extraordinary absolutely extraordinary why Shakespeare's yeah yeah I don't we no one would deny the, the force of his poetry <laughs> and these and they you know they're, they're fantastic plays in terms of a plot it's language it's surely it's language it's for theatre Shakespeare never works well on TV it doesn't it does. Well, not for me, it doesn't. It can be done, but it's, in the, it's, it's that liveness. So when I say verbal theatricality is when you can perhaps, you know, you can go overboard a bit on language um, because it's theatrical, because it's live, and it's not meant to be real. And ultimately, the audience fill in. Whereas I don't think there's, there's you have, I don't think the audience has got a lot of sympathy for TV and film where the, the production seem to be saying, you fill it in. You know, because... Uh, my, was it the third or fifth rant now, in the space of 10 minutes? I think TV is a passive experience, I really do. I really think it's just sitting there. So, you know, just sitting there, whereas in theatre, there's not actually much to look at. So you're gonna have to use your imagination a bit more to fill in the gaps, so I quite like that. But um, in my own playwriting, so these two things, verbal theatricality and unusual unconventional spaces, started to emerge. Attempt, that's attempting to mark out its distinct territory by making a virtue of all that is, of all, of the absence of all that is most commonly associated with conventional theatre auditorium. In other words, the proscenium arch, the lights, box, office, bar, the aesthetic was minimal, raw, austere even. Um, and this was from a review of the play using just a few wooden crates in a stripped back space. This agiprop, this agitation, propaganda, um, that was a style style of political theatre, actually. Um, I was quite chuffed with that, because that used to be very popular, agi prop theatre. You know, touring companies would go around working class areas, you know, and try and educate the masses. That's in the 1970s, it kind of died out. But I was quite pleased they, they, they named it this. Um, but they were saying, you know, that wooden crates and strip back spaces were um, precisely what community theatre is all about. The Morning Star, my goodness me, those of you who know about anything about the Morning Star, that's, a, that's seriously left wing paper. Um, so that's the kind of style of it. For me, the less there is on stage, and the more there is of the language and the acting, the better. I don't want to see a set. I'm, I'm so uninterested in a set in theatre. I couldn't care, because it's unlike, you know, you know, film or TV, if it's visual, you know, something which, you know, TV and film generally is, but if it's strikingly visual, it's fantastic, isn't it? 
you think of Avatar and so on, etc. Even if it's a really decent sized budget for theatre, I still think, oh yeah, I suppose it looks like the inside of a house. Fair enough, right, I've seen that. But as soon as you strip all that away, again, um, what, what has to come into play, and it ought to if the language and the acting is good enough, what comes into play is you suspend your disbelief. And your imagination fills in, doesn't it? And it's a lovely thing to do. So you start imagining the environment. Um, and essentially all my plays have kind of gone along on that style. So I'm just going to give you an excerpt here. So inspired in, and um, yeah, emboldened by the theatrical tabula rays. In other words, it's a blank space, really, Neighbours Hall. You know, it's unlike a theatre building, you know, it meant, oh, I could, I could put anything in there. I was once again able to experiment more freely, which I, I think I've hinted at, or more than hinted, I love playing around with um, and taking liberties with language. Um, using the conceit that Hardy and his fellow visionary will form, so he's, uh, he's a very important figure in the unions, the history of the unions, the new unionism that began at the turn of the century. Again, it's incredible to think that... Uh, the, the working man didn't have any representative. And you can imagine, you can just imagine, and we talk of health and safety now as being absurd. Well, it was really genuine then. Because there weren't any unions. <laughs> There's so many deaths um, due to that. Um, Wilford, they've been um, resurrected. The idea is, already I've sort of gone into a sort of fantasy land. The idea is Wilford and Keir Hardy being resurrected by the success of Jeremy Corbyn. Okay, as the... As, as, um, Corbyn is Labour leader, and capitalism's crisis, so-called crisis across the globe. And now they've returned, this is 100 years on, they've returned in spirit to proclaim that the history's on their side, which is what Jeremy Corbyn's been doing for 50 years. We should have a socialist government, he's been saying, hasn't he? <laughs> Not a right-wing government. You know, socialism is the way forward. We will have a paradise through this. So that was, the, uh, that was the starting point. So I thought, what great timing, 2016, when I wrote this. Corbyn, against all the odds, I think we all agree. It's astonishing that Jerry Corbyn would, would uh, ended up leaving the Labour Party. I think there was, I can't remember who it was, but certain, certain MPs, I think they're quite rueful at that, they actually added their name to, to, you know, to the ballot for him, for him to allow him to stand, thinking, never in a million years <laughs> will he get voted, and now they're thinking, you know. Um, but uh, I did find that quite amusing. So, here we go. So, on this one of these scenes here, so they've come back to Newham, resurrected. They are ghosts. <laughs> yeah. Which meant you can have fun with language. So, I thought, well, if they're spectres, they're ghosts. I don't need to have real language, do I? Um, that bores me to a certain extent. So, you can see their voices, a mixture of formality and slang. So, we start, ah, they start reminiscing. Yeah about their, you know, how passionate they were for socialism. Ah, those were the days. And nights, we were unstoppable. Well, there was so much to change. Democratic government, justice for labour, fair rents, work for the unemployed. We smashed it, comrade. Nailed it, my friend. And then, as long as I'm drawing attention to it, <laughs> you know, the audience aren't going to go, hang on, nailed it and smashed it. That doesn't sound very, you know, 19th century. As long as they, 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 um, they, I bring attention to it, they stare at each other, these two. A strange choice of words. It appears it's involuntary. A peculiarity of resurrection, I fear. We seem to be both past and present. Are we relevant again? So we can have fun with that kind of, um, say, that hybrid, that mix of, um, not old-fashioned language, but language that Hardy and Thorne, you know, the language they would have used, also with uh, a more contemporary, more contemporary feel to it. Same with the kids in it, and I'll explain what I mean by this, because we have... So the playfulness of language, not just confined to hard in form. Using again this mixed economy, this hybrid of professional actors and young people from the local area, but this time with a crucial difference, because when Chaplin met Gandhi in Revolution Farm, I think, you know, the, 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 the young people who were in it were playing young. This was, dare I say, revolutionary. It really was. This time, uh, the young performers played adults. Now that is a real tall order. Because they're not just playing adults, they're playing adults from another century. And uh, I've got photos, and we've got a little trailer, and I think they did just a magnificent job. But um, I called them, so they're, they're, they're basically, they were playing um, the workers. The workers at the time. Um, they were hardy and formed stirrer-uppers, you know, stirring up a bit of trouble. Awkward squad of West Ham agitators, union activists and supporters. It was, you know, it really was a brutal, brutal working life. 
you know, I think so 16, 18 hours a day, no safety checks whatsoever at all, you know, numerous accidents, numerous maiming, and so on. So um, no wonder these men started to coalesce around Hardy and Thorne, who started becoming known in the area, who, you know, representing them. Now, when Hardy and Thorne conjure up the ghosts of gas stokers, dockers, and casual labourers, <laughs> you could almost think, you know, we exchange that for zero hour contracts. <laughs> a, I think there is a lot of relevance still. Um, and ask them to help our, tell our story. So he's conjured back the two of them, conjured back the, uh, the old dock workers. Um, and there's, but their supporters inadvertently point to the decline in union power through a peculiar modern choice of language. So most people seem to get this when I'd written, you know, so one of the dockers is in response to Hardy saying, will you help us tell our story and remind people <laughs> why there's a Labour Party? <laughs> Billy says, I don't know, Miss Hardy, I'll have to think about it. Freddie, not being funny, but things have changed, mate. We ain't what we used to be. Maybe it's best to keep our heads down. Don't rock the boat line. And then Rose says, oh, my days, am I going to be famous, you know, on TV line? She's a bit of a digger, you know, celebrity fame and so on, you know. But um, that always got a, a laugh, so I kind of thought, well, that, 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 you know, that's quite legitimate to do. Um, and also, as I say, no one, no one would, uh, I would have thought, even if you're, you know, very much to the left, no one surely would disagree that the unions, yeah, they, they are not the force they used to be. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is another discussion. But certainly, um, when I was, when I was growing up, when I was a young man under the batter here, you know, um, there was an almighty, almighty ideological battle going on between the batter and the conservatives and the unions. Um, and brutally speaking, or frankly, you know, you could argue the unions lost that. Um, so I'm making a reference to it there. So, as I mentioned, in addition to performing sports for Red uh, in Neighbours Hall, we're also invited by Newham Councils, their community neighbourhood strategic... I have to have a pop at this. <laughs> Typical council title for a department. Newham Councils Community Neighbourhood Strategic Commissioning Department. So, but I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't mock it because they did put some money into it. Um, to perform the play in Newham's libraries. Uh, you know, as well as performing in the, in the Neighbours Hall for, I think we did four or five, we also took it around Newham's libraries and that has now has made me think, I wish we could do that, every, well I wish I could do that every time I wrote a play. It's the way forward. Let's get rid of the buildings. Who's with me? <laughs> Comrades, get rid of the buildings. We, the money you'd save, the libraries, we performed in every library in Newham and of course as it says here, it's a perfect fit for the play as Hardy, as you know his background, wretchedly poor, is a great believer in self-improvement through reading, and that's why you're and the value of books, and Newham has a strong record in hosting a range of cultural programmes from the theatre, film and performing arts in its libraries. Also, if we wanted, we could have had a lighting rig, we could have had a sound, so I know that, you know, the objection might be, but yeah, but you wouldn't have the same technical, I, I'm not really interested in that anyway. I, I personally, again, fifth round, sixth round, I'm losing track here. In terms of lighting and sound, you know, really good lighting and sound, it's, it's for musicals. I don't care. I really do not care about it unless you, you're into musicals, then you'd expect it because it's, you know, it's a commercial operation. But we didn't need lighting and sound. <laughs> and the wonderful thing was in each library, of course, well, <laughs> it's perfect. And that's part of the reason why I'm so, you know, almost messianic about it, about doing theatre in libraries. We've got a captive audience. You know, we've got, we've got an audience going, you know, they'll be looking at the book, they hear something. What's going on there? <laughs> I don't mind if they just come in halfway through, as long as they're, you know, they're always going to be quiet and stuff, because we've got, you know, we've got some people around, stage managers and so on. And, 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 and it, what I think is, you know, it's interesting, even if they just get a glimpse of it, it might, it might inspire them, it might, you know, to find out more. Whereas it is an effort to go to a theatre building, it does cost quite a bit. This was free because of Newham Council. They do so. They do that very, very well. They made the performances free for Newham residents. Some people are put off, but you know, I think you know. So I know Newham um, quite well, you know, and I think there's an argument to said a lot of people in Newham, you know, who don't go to the arts, don't think it's for them, which is which is real shame, or they get a bit self-conscious going into a theatre building. How do you behave, so on, etc. And it has got all these middle-class connotations, no doubt. 
But the libraries, of course, is, is unbelievably democratic. You know, no one ever questions it. Oh, I'm in the library because I need to, you know, get a book or I need to find out something about something. So it was a perfect, absolutely perfect fit. I was really, really pleased about that. Um, this is interesting, the, um, the academic bit here, research, the theatre designer, Cliff McLucas, a groundbreaking Welsh theatre company, Brithcroft, describes this revelatory process, it's really true, it's a revelation of layering that happens in site-specific performances. So that means that, obviously, along with Revolution Farm, with Newham City Farm, we had to work out how to adapt the site to our play and vice versa. You had to do it with Neighbours Hall because it was blank. You know, although that it was a big hall, it didn't have any of the usual things you associate with the building. So in a way, you're starting from scratch. But I found this layering, you know, echoing my own experience of working on a splotch of red. And it's interesting, Mike Pearson, who's the co-artistic director of this company, and they were groundbreaking in terms of removing theatre or moving plays from a building and doing them, you know, anywhere but a theatre building. He says he's written site-specific performances of the coexistence and overlay of two basic sets of architecture. Those are the present building, or what he called the host. So the host is Neighbours Hall. That which is the site. And those are the constructed scenographer, us, the playwright, director, or the ghost. That which is temporary, because it's a ghost. I really like that description, because we're only at Neighbours Hall for about a week, and then we're gone. Uh, we as if we're no longer there, or hopefully we left traces. And I really, really like that idea. Site itself became an active component in the creation of performative meaning, rather than just a neutral space, because again, I'm being so didactic, I know, but, you know, <laughs> theatre buildings are neutral. They really are. They're just neutral. They're just a flash space, really. <laughs> I know that's very dismissive, but uh, in the context of this, this argument, I'd say they are. Whereas Neighbours Hall has a statement already. The minute you get in there, because you're going to be aware, oh, I must be in an area where, uh, or a hall, or at least a building, where it's clearly, it, it performs a social function for the community. You know, you're really aware. It's not neutral. <laughs> so, admittedly, you'd have to get the play right. You know, you couldn't put, I don't know, something like Cats, the musical, in Neighbours Hall. You know, an Andrew Lloyd Webber musical wouldn't really seem, you know, no one, no one would um, uh, join, be able to join the dots, really. Uh, as I say, you know, why I'm, I'm just wax lyrical uh, about the library, the uniqueness of the library performances, and said the presence of the public who hadn't come to watch the play. I quite like that. I hadn't come to watch it, obviously not. You know, you don't have plays in, in, in you know, every day in a library. Um, but they were browsing bookshops and found themselves drawn in by events. So, in effect, there's the inner circle of spectators, you know, who've, who, who've come for the play, who know that it's been performed. And an outer circle of hopefully curious live, and they think they were. I did get a chance to talk to them. And they'd go in and out, you know, stand there or maybe sit down and then, who knows? I mean, it's hard to quantify, isn't it? Uh, if you're asking the question, well, do you think that uh, <laughs> they'd be, um, it'd make them want to go to see theatre and the arts? Um, and possibly that's the wrong question to ask in the first place. Um, maybe the question is, how much do you know about Keir Hardy? <laughs> how much do you know uh, about Newham's history? And if you were interested, there's books here <laughs> on Keir Hardy. Um, so, at the, and, and it's true, at some of the setups, a uh, small crowd would assemble around the cast and the actors. Um, and ask questions, and it was if someone new was in town, and the host, you know, host community were curious. So again, another echo of this host and ghost um, mixture. McLucas's point about the site itself having the potential for meaning, power, and resonance was something our audiences could relate to. Yeah, it wasn't just performing in the, you know, I didn't want it to be a museum piece, which, you know, as I said, the argument might be that the danger of doing it in a theatre building is that that was then, you know that feeling? That was then, now this is now. No, I think Gear Hardy, I think Splosh and Red, I know I'm biased, I wrote it, but it clearly, it ought to have political resonances today. So, yes, it did celebrate local history and heritage, why not? It's, I think it's a really good thing to do. But it was celebrating this in a personal, intimate way with the community. And of course, the reason why I think it works in libraries, you've got the libraries were local to them, uh, to the the, the, um, the residents in the library, the story was local to them, 
And this is probably the icing on the cake. The young, they would have known some of the young performers. And that's why coming back to this localist, localist, a localist approach, I'm a big fan of that. Possibly, argue we could have more power than me. So this, is, this is sort of my last final rant on it. Like having moving theatre, I quite like this, moving theatre, the need to have a play. We were talking about, wasn't it tradition? In our English class this morning, that, that shocking story, The Lottery, by Shirley Jackson where the plot spoiling it, you know, these villagers have this stoning to death ritual and they keep doing it because it's just, that's how I feel about theatre building. You know, I know people say, well, for goodness sake, we've always done it. We've always had plays in theatre buildings. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Removing the theatre from the need. And a lot of theatre, you know, isn't in buildings now. Site-specific, immersive theatre, as you know, they've taken it out. They've taken it out of the buildings. Uh, but I quite like this, moving theatre with the need to have a play inside a building in order to call it a theatre. Uh, you know, it's quite proprietor in some ways. Yeah, this is, you know, theatre has to be in a building because otherwise it's not theatre, you know, which is, which is ludicrous, isn't it? But there is that, maybe that suggestion, or isn't mainstream or official, sanctioned. Uh, place it instead in the core community service, like a library, because I think this is the case where, in most boroughs, but certainly in Newham, the library doubles as not only where you get books, but as a, as a service for the community. Yeah, I think most libraries are like that nowadays. Um, you remove at one fell swoop some of the cult some of the, some of the cultural, social and economic barriers facing those who feel excluded or alienated from the arts. And I'm in my um, PhD, which is currently taking a long, long time, um, understandably, if they do take a long time, I've made a reference to what the Arts Council, so the Arts Council basically distributes millions and millions and millions and millions of your money <laughs> to arts organisations. And Newham has a euphemism for, for Newham, uh, this Arts Council has a euphemism for the arts in Newham. I think I might have mentioned this before. It's like something out of Orwell. They call Newham a cold spot, a cold spot for the arts, meaning, brutally speaking, no one goes to the theatres. No one goes to the arts. They're not interested. I mean, they're not saying that in a way, but, you know, a cold spot. They've identified a cold spot. So, um, you know, I think in terms of those who've been excluded or alienated from arts, if you asked a lot of people in Newham, I'm convinced of this, it could be a research project for one of your students, um, about, you know, why don't you go to the arts more? Well, why don't you? And when you say arts, you, you're talking dance, theatre, not, not TV or film. I think a lot of them would, would, would or a few of them might say, Oh, I don't know, I don't know if it's for me. You know, what, it's all a sad thing to say, isn't it? Understandable though, but... Spotter Red say was free. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we, we could only do that, by the way. There has to be realism there. We could only make it free because we got a big grant. Otherwise, that, that is complex. I'm not even a fan of things being free. I'm not, I'm not, I have to say that. I think, you know, I've got, I, I would take issue with that. I, you know, the feeling that possibly, or the view that if it's free, is it worth seeing? You know, and that life is not free. <laughs> so we did have an issue with the council, but at the end of the day, it's interesting, the council said, we can't support this in the libraries if you charge. So it's quite interesting. I didn't, you know, it wasn't hugely complex. I thought, well, look, you know, it's, I think it, hopefully it will benefit the community. So let's do it. And we have got, we are subsidised. Otherwise, we would have to charge. Um, and if the experience of watching the play in a library was an inclusive, accessible and welcoming one, which we hope it was for the residents, um, it may point to the future to a richly symbolic and productive relationship between libraries as the hosts and plays as ghosts um, that reclaim the public nature of the arts, you know, for the many and not the few. And I really, really passionately believe that because I saw it in my own two eyes. You know, all the libraries we did in New York, about five or six libraries, and each performance, I know for a fact, because I know the area so well, that they were not the kind of people who would normally you'd find at the roll call, you know, or even at Theatre Royal Stratford East. They were in their library for another reason altogether. But obviously, you know, it was great that they were curious and, and seemed to stay for most of the time. So I think that's, um, how are we doing? Yeah, I think that's essentially, yeah, I'll show you some photos. <laughs> Shall I? After that, there we go. So you've got Keir Hardy, Will Thorne, the Dockers. Isn't that marvellous? I have to say, see a photo like that, it really is, really is. Um, we had a designer, kind of, you know, Keir Hardy wore this cloth cap, 
or stove pot. I can't remember what it was. It was a deer stalker. Yes. Deer stalker. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's absolutely fascinating, man. Really was. In his foot, you can imagine because he's. You see that unlike. Jeremy Corbyn, it has to be said. <laughs> Keir, Keir Hardy is the real thing in terms of working class. When he took his seat in Parliament, or when I think the story goes that when he arrived at Parliament, he was wearing a deer stalker and he didn't look like your typical MP. I think the, uh, I think the, the security said the tradesman's entrance is round the back. <laughs> so, you know, imagine the prejudice and, uh, if he, he would have experienced. There's Will Thorne in full, you know, stirring up the. The Dockers. Yeah, a brutal working life with no absolutely no representation, and he says at that time, you know, you you had someone behind you, someone might who fight for your for your rights and better working conditions. This is an interesting scene, you know, as an example of those appalling, you know, appalling working conditions. Um, so this is all, it's all, you know, this is all based on, you know, during my research. Uh, based on what happened down at the docks, and this is known as a call on. So this is the the uh, I think it's the chief docker or, or or foreman. This is the foreman. All the men every morning would go run down to the docks and put their hands up to get picked for work that day. It was so desperate that fights broke out. You know, savage, brutal fights because a man's got to work and a man's got to feed his family at that time. You know, unbelievable to think about that, and but you've got kids doing it, young people. So there's certain other resonances, you know, sweatshops and so on. You think that came out of that um, because they look so desperate. I'll work, I'll work, I'll do anything to work. Um, so that, they have a difference of opinion there. It's lovely. I, I really do. You know, to play adults. That's. I mean, adults playing adults. It's hard to play us sometimes, isn't it? Hard to be an adult sometimes. Like that. They did a terrific job there. These two are dockers. I think this one here, he's saying, I can't join in the fight, the union fight, you know, because I need to work. Mm. Disappointed, saying we have to, <laughs> we have to win this battle. Is the kids doing this? <laughs> I think they did a remarkable job. That's community hall, not terrific photos, unfortunately. The ones before were taken professionally, but I think we've taken on my mobile. That's neighbours hall. So that's where Keir Hardy would have spoken somewhere, rallying, rallying the men of Newham um, to change, change things. It's more there again. I quite, as I say, it's, you know, mentioned that note about stripped down. <laughs> I just like the fact that soap boxes. I quite, I really like that idea. <laughs> that was Keir Hardy outside, <laughs> or Samuel playing Keir Hardy outside the um, community links. And there's the man himself at Trafalgar Square. I mean, he's wonderful. Think about, I mean, he's, you know, passionate, <laughs> you know. Well, that, more that Masonic zeal he's got, isn't it, in Trafalgar. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's it. Uh, so it's over. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Though, because I support Jeremy Corbyn, so it's nice to know where it comes from. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you say a lot of people are saying, um, you know, he's taking the party back to do its original roots, you know. Uh, whereas but the, the interesting thing is, of course, because you know, Blair, many would say New Labour hasn't, but but of course, the irony is Blair won three, three election victories in a row. Yeah. Now, we don't know what's going to happen, I must admit, it's an we all know it's an unstable time, so we could still see a Corbyn led government. <laughs> um, uh, it's very interesting, James. I enjoyed that. Um, just a, a couple of questions. I mean, I think just about Blair. I think the Tories lost three elections. <laughs> it's quite important. Uh, I like that. Well, I, I know. The, the I, heard him I heard him described as the cockerel standing on the dung heap, convinced that the sun is rising because it's crowing. <laughs> And uh, I think there's quite a lot of truth. That, that's, that's beside the point. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the, the, the performance. There's, there's a few questions, really. Firstly, I mean, I do think it's interesting performing in libraries, which 
are, are an unforbidding place for intellectual yeah. inquiry, aren't they? So yeah. people feel that it's right to yes. go in there. That's so the I word. can understand yeah. the council saying they don't want to introduce any concept that you have to pay to yeah. get in there. Yeah. Um, uh, but also that means that people would come in and go. I'd be quite interested, uh, and I've got three link questions, so quite interested to know how the, how the performers felt about that, because having seen now anxiously the performer will see whether they have an audience to see any of it leaving during the performance. Yeah, it's a really good question. The second yeah. one is what sort of role did the performers play in devising the performance itself? Yeah. And finally, maybe you could say something else a bit more about the mixed economy. My area of work for some time has been on unpaid wages. And Oh, it's I'm the very, email, conscious, yeah. very conscious in the theatre yeah. of this discussion. What is the difference between a paid performer and an amateur, a volunteer? I mean, yeah. If you go up to York, there's a massive, massive performance which goes on which makes a lot of money, and the reward is you get a chance to perform in it. Now, well, obviously the people who are running the thing get a salary, so... There is a yeah. question there, and yeah, there is. You know, there is. These are working class yeah. kids. Yeah, no, it's very, they're all they're all very good questions actually. It might have to remind me. The first one's about um, the first the, one is about the, 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 how did the performers oh. feel about? Yeah, I think they well, the answer to that is when we were casting, yeah. um, the uh, we made it very clear where it was going to be performed mm -hmm. and what the audience were going to be like. In terms of, I mean, that sounds a bit judgmental. I mean, in terms of it could be volatile yeah. uh, at, it, at its most extreme. You know, the audience could leave, they could stay, they could, you know, they might say something. You know, we'll just have to, you know, um, we'll have to work with that. I, most, and to be honest, you know, if you say that up front to an actor and you mean it, <laughs> we have to say we mean it. Yeah. This is not, if you don't think this, for you, this is for you, of course that's fine. You know, but it is a very localist, you know, community orientated. So that was one, you know, I think that was the chief way we did it, really. I mean, you know, they, they were all consummate, you know, professionals. I mean, and, and the, the, you know, that includes the, 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 uh, the young people as well. Um, and the second question is about the... What, what role did they have in devising the performance? I mean, were they just reading a script? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I know, it's... It's non-negotiable with me. I've, I've written about this in my PhD. I'm not a big fan of devised work. I am keen on the single authorial voice, so I wrote it. And I have, I am, yeah. Some people call it precious. Other, others would call it just, you know, well, that's what I do. I write I plays. Sorry, and, I don't yeah. you feel there's a contradiction there between your idea of the participatory nature of a yeah. performance in a particular space, but don't tell me what this performance is about, because I know. Don't you think there's a tension there? Not really, no. I mean, I, well, although I say not really, I mean, I've written about it because if you were to put this under applied theatre, devised theatre, mm. labels like that, yes, I think it would be, you know, that would be problematic. But I feel that, well, I go off and, you know, I do the research. I'm an experienced playwright and I know what I want to say with it. And I'm just not a fan of devised work. I just don't think, I, don't, I just don't, I'm not convinced. And, you know, powerful work can come from many voices. You don't but find that's contradictory. No, I know, I know. The, you, I've the written whole nature of yeah. collaborative and cooperative working. But I think it's what you yeah. used to play about. But it's not in terms of the writing. Yeah. yeah, and I think, but I think that's okay. But you've raised a really, really important point that I do address in my PhD. But Slightly being tangential, my interesting. My supervisor said, "Oh, I wouldn't. You know, you're going off the tangent there. If your work was applied the theatre, and yet you are writing the plays yourself, but it isn't. It doesn't come under that bracket." Mm. That is a very interesting question. It's never been raised with me by um, the performers or anyone connected with the play. But there's there's a there's always a first. Oh, the reason it comes <laughs> to my mind, if you don't mind me just taking it. Is you were talking about the uh, youngsters performing as dockers and, and the call off mm. and everything, and I was reminded very strongly of Ken Loach's film um, It's a Free World, where at one point he has uh, an agency boss in a car, car park with a whole load of migrant agency workers calling them off and saying, You work, you work, you work. Oh, right. I haven't seen and that. Her, and of course, there's a lot of participation in the construction of a Ken Loach film. Thank yeah. you. And one of the performers who's playing the father of this woman, witnesses it and says to her, 
I thought them days were over. And the reason that's particularly um, uh, poignant is the actual, the guy who was the performer, a bloke, bloke called Colin Cochrane, who had been a transport and general worker's steward in the docks right. in London. Yeah. So he was speaking of what he knew. And it just, just seems to me that the people in that environment have a story also to tell which relates to yeah. the story that you were developing. Well, that, that now it's very interesting actually because my two plays before I did this trilogy mm. uh, were about uh, dementia and elder abuse and involved elderly um, volunteers right. with some experience of dementia or at least looking after someone with dementia. So I suppose that was, you know, that was a that was an example of, a, um, you know, a, a production that was inclusive to the extent that I researched their stories. But I guess with Keir Hardy, it's tricky, isn't it? Because it's it's quite a long time ago. But I just quickly come on to your third question. Was very interesting. Is and it work and should it be paid? Yeah. <laughs> now here's something maybe we can all uh, you know have a have a response to. My answer is quite brutal, I suppose. Or oh, maybe we feel my director and people and my funders, we feel it's a, uh, <laughs> maybe it's a get out, but it could be an easy answer. Well, they're kids. Now, when I did the dementia play, these were elderly volunteers in their 60s or 70s. They got paid nothing. Is that right? Mm, I don't know. However, I seem to make an exception, the fact that should we be paying, should we have paid young, they're, they're in their secondary school and some in primary school. That's not right, is it? I don't know. But you, you, they're getting older, <laughs> you know, when we use them. I think we're, I'm doing a version of Alice Wonderland, and some of them will be 16, 17, so you, you could have, you know, <laughs> raised a thorny issue here. And you know what I like? Why well, I like the question, because you know, they're wonderful. We work with them, you know, on a couple of places. They probably will start asking, and we've done our job so well, because <laughs> they'll say, by the way, could we have some expenses, you know, or something now, <laughs> you know, and start negotiating? <laughs> Oh, an equity fringe yeah. contract. Yeah, I mean, we do it for the actors. But you're, it's a really good question, even though that I've said that they're kids. I think there will come a point when their parents or the kids will say, you know, could we have, you know, is, there, do we, is this remunerated in any way? Because at the moment, you know what happens? When we contact their parents, because we've got a good relationship with the schools they go to, and their, parent, their parents inevitably say, what, you mean you're taking them off our hands for three weeks? <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> but at some point, if that question was put to them, I know what they'd answer. They'd say, yeah, we should have. But, I don't know, they're all under, at the moment, all, you know, 15, 14. Would that be an acceptable thing to do? To pay them? I don't know. But a really, really good question. I think it will be, you know, it is something that is going to be, um, have to be addressed. <laughs> I mean, it troubles me in the whole cultural sector. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. I been that playwriting for 25 years and I remember when I started the so-called profit share which is the biggest miss that used to when you're starting out as a playwright it happens today but I don't think so much is you do work in fringe theatre and uh, you do anything and they'd often say in the advert profit share which meant if there was any money left over which there never was so yeah you, you're basically giving your labour free but I mean are they giving labour are they just is it an educational experience? It's an educational experience, yeah. <laughs> they, you know, I, I, they, they do, yeah, but they do, mind you, they give up a lot of time, three, four weeks in the summer, yeah. but I guess that that makes me think, that makes me know they're very committed. Very committed. And they, they do have a lot of fun on it, but it still does raise, I think, it, you know, four weeks out of there. I, w I would cite <laughs> a theatre maker that I interviewed when I was doing that paper, and he justified the whole profit share model and all the rest of it because I said to him, you, do you think that experience and exposure is some form of currency? He said, it's not form, it is a currency. And it is until you try and pay your rent with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. there's yeah. a big question because then it feeds over into unpaid internships, and yeah. work experience and unpaid trial shifts. The actually, notion that yeah. their time and labour yeah. power is worth it. And it's actually, quite an important lesson. Yeah, no, uh, it's very interesting. Actually, you might maybe thought I have missed out something, an important fact here about Newham Council uh, subsidising, uh, which no, that was the thing I didn't mention. Yes, I got a, uh, I'd been um, supported by the Royal Docks Trust, uh, a local 
um, funding organisation. So yes, we did. We got paid. And, you know, we got the uh, as a player, obviously, um, the director and the actors. But when Newham Council said, "Do you want to do it in the libraries?" and we said, "Yeah, fantastic, great. We'll only charge a fiver," which I thought still was we could have this argument. But I, I do feel I know Newham. I thought no, a fiver's okay. A five tenner, forget it. Fiver's okay. I know you, you didn't. Yeah. I thought we, we're not. You know, this is not extreme. It's not. You know, people are not literally homeless. You know, I've seen it in Newham. Um, but council, I think you're right, ultimately said, mm, we're not comfortable with that. And that's fair enough in libraries. Mm. But that's when we said, coming back to money, said, well, we're not going to pay for it out of our grant. Mm. <laughs> so you couldn't get out, away from this kind of capitalist mode. We said, well, we'll have to pay. So we said, are you going to pay for it? Which they did. So they subsidised it. They, gave, they put in two and a half grand. Mm. That's a fair bit, that is. So in case, you know because it was about 10 or 15 performances around Newham. Um, maybe that was, you know, I, I, it was impossible to work it out whether we, you know. But, yeah, it seemed, you know, I mean, it's so difficult, isn't it? Everything costs, and yet you're, as you say, you're trying, one is trying to do it from a participant, a genuinely inclusive. But, but what I, as my final point, I would definitely say, I'm, um, I sort of think I've made myself very, <laughs> probably, you know, nauseatingly clear, huge fan of site specific and libraries is because they're quite modern now especially the ones where i live so they're easily adaptable for a performance space and you you know all this final rant all this arts council talk of us oh, cold spot cold spot let's chuck 50 grand let's chuck 100 grand let's give this company it will make no difference whatsoever it'll make no difference whatsoever. the money should be better spent um funding organizations you know not just theater um, but, you know, who can use the library as arts resources? Because you've got your local audience there. Whereas, as I say, Theatre Royal Stratford can put on a play, Equus, they're putting on Equus by Peter Schaffer. And uh, I bet you anything, isn't the local community going to that? Anyway, that's, arg you know, arg arguable. Yeah. I'm and conscious of time. I think okay. Before we close, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your next project? Certainly, yeah. Wow, this is, it'll be involving, I hope, these kids again. Alice in Wonderland, but an East End version, hence the title Alice in Canning Town. Do we have dates? Yes, we do. 12th, 12th to the 19th of August. It will gain, it will be performed nowhere near. <laughs> Funnily enough, not inside a theatre, in Canning Town's Ark in the Park, which is, I'm so excited about it because it's so perfect in terms of uh, the relationship between the play and the site. Ark in the Park is a wonderfully surreal very strange, unconventional adventure playground for disadvantaged children and young people. It's perfect, absolutely perfect. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that and hope to see you all there. Great. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank you. Much, James. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming.